Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Shannon. Thank you for joining Snow Isle Libraries for History of Crows and Corvids in Modern Media. This program is part of Snow Isle Reads Together, our first ever system-wide community read event featuring Hollow Kingdom by Kira Jane Buxton. In this webinar, we will be exploring the many ways stories and films have portrayed the crow as an omen, a trickster, or even a flock of horrors as in Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. Before we begin the presentation, let's now take a moment to tend to a little housekeeping. Please keep your microphones muted until it's your chance to speak so everyone can hear our speaker and other members. Feel free to use the chat for questions for library staff. We will also use chat on our end to share links to any resources and websites mentioned today. After the presentation, we will have time to ask her some of your questions. So please feel free to submit questions for her into the chat at any time. and We will get to as many as we can. Finally, if you would like to turn on captions for this event, you can find the instructions in the chat. Without further ado, let's introduce today's speaker. We are joined today by Dr. Ursula Valdez, a University of Washington lecturer and professor specializing in natural history and ecology. Her research has identified more than 50 species of birds in the UW Bothell wetlands, and she most recently presented at the campus's annual Crow Watch. Hello, Ursula. Thank you so much for being here. Now I'm mute. Hey, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Shannon. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, everybody, for he being here tonight. And I'm really excited about sharing something about crows and discussing a little bit with you. So let me share my screen, which should be ready, but now it's not. Sorry. I don't know what happened. It always happens, all these technical things. I'm sorry. I don't know. Ah, we just practiced and it was all good. Okay. Um, I'm going to share with sound, making sure all is good. And hopefully if I can get a little feedback, if I, if you can see me and hear me well, can you tell me and see if my screen, Shannon? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Excellent. So thank you very much again. We're going to talk about Corbett's in the modern media. And this is what I have planned for you tonight. So I'm going to tell you very briefly about why I'm interested in crows. We'll discuss a little bit about crows and their connections with humans over like the past history, but then we're going to move into the modern media and just kind of give you a general idea of how crows have influenced so much and have been part of human life in so many ways. So I'm a tropical avian ecologist. So I'm originally from Peru and my specialty is studies about birds. So I love crows for many reasons because um, I'm an ornithologist. So I'm watching birds all the time. My life revolves about birds, bird life, forests, ocean everywhere. I've done a lot of work in South America where there are no crows. I moved here about 20 something years ago. It's gonna be 22 years ago for grad school, and I was introduced to crows in Washington, in Seattle. And I was even luckier to be introduced. Um, I was a graduate student at UW, at the University of Washington in Seattle, and have mentors who were highly connected with crows. So John Marshall was one of my um, faculty mentors in my for my dissertation in my committee. And um, I spent a lot of time watching birds and obviously crows. I work and I teach at the University of Washington where I'm engaging students in the observation of birds. And of course, we have to watch a crows. Crows are in our campus. We have the one of the largest crow roost in Washington are in the, in the University of Washington. This is our campus in Bothell. And as you know, crows are social and that's part of the nature. There's nothing supernatural about crows moving in huge amounts to one place or another. That's just part of the natural history. I think you already learn about their natural history. They're social animals. And they have places where they go every day, every night to rest. And then they leave those places, those roost in the morning to do their own activities in different parts of their city or the city or the places that they visit. So just for you to have a sense that 
how we can see an afternoon in the winter cross in the campus in Buffett. Pretty impressive. Several yeah, thousands of folks returned to campus uh, at the end of the day. And they first arrive in campus and they're in the, in the, in the buildings. And then they are going to be in um, going into the wetlands and spending the night there. Some ideas about these behaviors are that are associated with safety. Some other possibilities are associated with microenvironments that they found there uh, with much more warmer temperature. And, and especially they go there in, in fall and winters. There are not many of them in, during the summer and spring. But um, one of the things that it happens is that because of other researchers, we learned that during the breeding season, they don't spend, especially the ones who have paired, they stay where they have built a nest, which is everywhere else. So only the singletons go back to the roost. So the numbers on the spring and summer in the roost are much lower. As I mentioned, I've been very lucky to be on, um, part of communities of learning at the University of Washington. And I learned a lot about ecological and behavioral studies, especially from the Marsloof lab, Dr. John Marsloof and his students. I learned a lot from his students and I have used actually, I haven't participated directly in the research, but I have used a lot of the information to influence um, my teaching. And I also learned directly some techniques for research that I could do with my own personal research for my PhD when I did some studies of birds of prey in, in uh, Peru. Also the University of Washington, Doug, uh, Dr. Douglas Walker, he does a lot of studies on behavior and communication uh, associated to the uh, rules that we have and also the distribution of these crows in different parts of the city. So he has been monitoring these changes and I have benefited for this, uh, the work of colleagues, um, again, from mentors and peer, uh, fellow grad students and colleagues at UW Bothell. The other reason that um, it's important for me is because I teach about crows. So I teach classes that are associated with um, teaching about the biology of the birds, but also uh, looking through the all those different associations that crows have with human societies. So they are going to learn, I mean, the, the, the crows in particular in the Pacific Northway, the American crows are a very important aspect of the culture, about the history, about um, mythology, arts, and many more. So associated to the Pacific Northwest and many others in the world too. So just to bring it a little bit um, for, again, you probably have heard about this, crows, ravens, jays, magpies are all in the, and rooks in, uh, also in, um, in, in Europe are associated to the fam within the family Corvidae. So whenever we talk about the, the crow, there is not really the crow. There is about 40 different species of crows all over the world. What we have in North America, at least in the Pacific Northwest, is the American crow. And we also have the common raven. And we have some other jays that are familiar for you. But just for you to know that it's there is several species of within the Corvidae and at least 40 species of crows in the world. I learned a lot about the American crow from different people, and I have adopted this species as one of my favorites. So in particular, the one that we have here in the Pacific Northwest, the Corvus brachyrhynchus or the American crow, um, which is actually has a huge distribution. So this map, and you can see both in orange and in purple where the populations of crows are. The breeding populations are in, in in North America, and also some of them may be short distance migrants. Um, these birds are very particular. We all know they're calling co call. It's not a song. Birds, uh, crows cannot sing. Not all birds sing. That's something that's interesting. And we know that you know they live in areas that are highly associated to humans um, in urban development. So they eat everything. They're omnivorous. That's the technical word very social species, which in some cases has given them bad reputation because they scare people that don't know enough about their natural history. Another really fascinating um, uh, characteristic of crows is that they eat everything. They're omnivores. And they're, that's one of the reasons that are highly adaptable for environments 
um, that are associated to humans because they can find all types of food from wild species to, to potato chips, to fries, to peanuts in the garden, to everything, garbage, everything that you can, things that find, they found in the garbage. And, you know, especially around this time of the year, you probably are seeing this particular picture is taken in my garden. When the crows are pulling some of the rope, I had it attached to one of my trellises and they're pulling that for nesting material. If you've seen it already, many of them are being in court in this place. The males take little gifts to the females and then they start building their, their nest. So right now, many of them are in the process of finishing a nest soon they be incubating uh, their eggs. So usually they have one successful brood a year. They tend to have one or two successful baby um, that they grow and after even that they can catch more, more eggs, but usually one to two survive. They're incubated for 19 days and then take about 35 days in the nest before they fly. And they are with the parents for a while until they're at least six or eight weeks. And sometimes they even may stay longer. Just one cool um, observation that probably in late July, August, you're just gonna start seeing babies. Tell You can tell babies by this little, especially if they're very young, by this special, the, this very little kind of yellowish orange piece on the mouth, that's the gap. And then their eyes are kind of bluish. So that's very common to see in young birds. So let's talk about crows and the connections with humans. So not crows of all parts of the world. So as I mentioned, there's at least 40 different species of crows plus two, two, two species or three of ravens. And they have influenced people all over the world. And in the past, like in, you know, in the mythology of many cultures or to the present, and I'm here, I'm just putting a picture of myself like a few years ago with one of my friend crows, which come and know me very well. And probably many of you have experienced that. They remember phrases. They can tell um, different characteristics of people. They are highly uh, tolerant in human presence. And sometimes they can develop a little interesting relationship with humans. These crows will let me, this was at least four years ago, they will let me get really close to them when I was going to give them food or when I was gardening some of the times here. Actually, I'm going to give them food. I'm going to give them some peanuts. I don't feed them all the time. That's something that I'm, it's, I love them, but I know their populations are not in trouble. They don't need food. We don't need many more crows as much as I love them. So it's a little bit kind of an interesting, you know, connection in there that as an ecologist, I need to know the limits of, of this. Um, and um, as long as I wouldn't um, establish eye contact, they were very comfortable with me. I know stories of people who actually get them to get very close. So let's review a little bit just before we go into like more present times. Some of the early human connections or at least the evidence of connections between crows and humans. Probably this is a, a, some Paleolithic art from France and some caves that were found in, in France. And probably this is one of the oldest manifestations in art or in some sort of expression um, of manifestation of human and crow association. So here we can see a, a, something that looks like a person. There is a bird here that potentially is a crow. And there's also a head on the, on the body of the potential person uh, representing a bird head, right? So um, there is several... Obviously, we don't know what the person or the people who were doing this were thinking at the time, but uh, we can interpret it that as a maybe a depiction of a prehistoric hunting, uh, a hunter's death. You know, there's some animals here and there's some elements of hunting. Um, maybe the bird-headed man represent the, the soul. Um, there's a bird that potentially could be a crow, but definitely we're already seeing a little bit of association to death in there. Uh, Think about earlier times when, you know, part of the nature of humans was at that time before agriculture, it was a matter of finding resources through hunting and gathering, right? So sometimes when we think about the Pacific Northwest, um, salmon arriving in the, in the um, mouth of the river or the rivers, then maybe collecting some of the, some of the salmon, 
that will hang the food, obviously that may have attracted crows or ravens. And that was something that either they needed to uh, prevent getting too much for the crows. So they may set up some images that were scarecrows. And also now we know a little bit more the history about there is in many representations of Native Americans. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, we see a raven as a figure that is standing there representing window, window, wisdom, understanding, representing creation, and so on. So really interesting things that we've seen not only in the Pacific Northwest, we see things in France, in Japan, with the three-legged uh, Yatagaratsu, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Pacific Northwest um, art, they're representing Raven, a corvid, and the family as the creator of the world or the one who brought the light to the world. There are several Native American um, stories that they, they tell the story of Raven bringing the sun into the world when everything was dark before. There's other cultures and many things that we can see. Oh, we got a little bit in here. So um, there's some representations in uh, paintings and the signs and the, by the, um, this is the jungle crow, the house crow in the India, um, um, uh, in like the Hinduism represented in, um, in several ways, crows, um, and that's something that it is associated to some of the female goddesses. So really interesting, you know, depiction of crows already in there. Um, what it was um, in there, maybe some something again associated to wisdom or some good things. Um, the Japanese culture in the past has also have had some mythology and some representations in several paintings and several um, ceramic pieces of um, Yatagaratsu, which is this three-legged crow, which it seems that represents um, when the gods you know, sent this three-legged crow, Yatagaratsu, to establish Yamato territories. Um, supposedly, you know, in the kind of representing the intervention, the divine intervention, divine intervention in human affairs. Um, there is a crow castle in Japan that it was built in the 1500s that also honoring uh, crows in this case. And in Japan is the jungle crow. Um, there is a big association to death that in actually in certain way is true. It is true that crows and ravens are associated to death, but the day don't bring death. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. It's actually the opposite. Death brings crows. So as the human, obviously, uh, the human population expanded in the medieval times in particular, where sanitation was not like the best for um, for those times, a lot of diseases have spread it, like the, the plague and many other things. And then also a lot of wars happened, a lot of conflicts. Good. So that left a lot of dead people and either by war or by um, diseases. Uh, a lot of people die. And there was massive dead that obviously, unfortunately, there was a lot of people laying in this either war zones or or the uh, or the cities. And crows are scavengers. Ravens are scavengers. They are attracted they, in a natural ecosystem. They have a little bit the role of being actually taking care of all those, you know, corpses that are from other animals. Roadkill, for example, if you see something kill in the road or some, you know, animal that is being dead, it's going to be attracting crows and, and ravens. And that is the role that naturally they have. So this was an opportunity for crows to be finding food, but obviously when from the human perspective, that was, and given the darkness of those times, there was a strong association and fear that every time that people will see crows, and especially because at certain times that probably there were many, and then imagine the video that I have shown you um, animals roosting nearby, that must have been really terrific at those times. So that association was really um, highly uh, uh, added to, to the idea of death. And, you know, you probably are very familiar the depiction of the doctor uh, with a massive crow during the plague. And that's, again, really interesting that um, 
a lot of representations with dead and the plague and all those things were associated to roles. But as I mentioned, that's actually something really important when it comes to the ecological role as scavengers in nature or opposed opportunistic feeders. Uh, it's really interesting that, you know, whenever we refer to a group of crows, we call them a murder of crows. And when there's a log of ravens, we call them an unkindness. So negative connotations that have been perpetuated for many reasons and in different in different um, cultures. So it is really interesting how this has expanded not only from the past, but from a more recent uh, past and then also to the current times, there's always a little bit darkness associated to crows and ravens, dead, you know, witches, something associated to just something dark times. And we're going to review some of these things um, over the next slides. And also it's really interesting how um, <clears throat> from the point of view of, um, I mean, different cultural aspects, take sometimes those situations, you know, like sometimes it's probably the kind of the human nature, a little bit of the, the uh, curiosity and at the same time that ability for us as humans, that when we cannot explain something, we don't understand some natural phenomenon, we attribute that to something dark or to something supernatural. So that has been a great element and great material for making movies, writing stories, writing poems, incorporating characters in movies and so on. So especially the misconceptions of crows have inspired movies. And if you ask the ordinary person, they tend to be afraid of crows. If you're here in this seminar, which is normally what I tell my students, if you're here taking the class that I teach about crows, it's either because you're incredibly fascinated with crows, you may be a little bit curious, or you're actually very afraid and you want to know, <laughs> right? So we have, and that's something that even sometimes dark things that are that we're fear of get a lot of our attention. So again, that's a great material to inspire many movies and, and, and just in general, different things. So just let's look at one of the classic moon, relatively recent. I mean, it's not from the century for the past, but it's a relatively recent in, in the spectrum of time for the human human history. This movie has been very significant for the perception of crows and the expanding the misconceptions of those. So famous Alfred Hitchcock, The Birds. That was a movie that it just brought, you know, a story that when you think about it, and when you think about it now with all the, the different things we know about birds, it's kind of like, what? And I think even won an Oscar for, it was like a special effects or something, which in the in that again if we use the eyes that we have today to even judge special effects that would be like the worst special effects at this time but in their time was so fascinating the story and especially the presence of of birds so actually alfred, alfred hitchcock liked birds and he had a pet a pet bird a pet crow actually and of course, they recreated this movie with a lot of puppets. They used sounds that they were not real. They were all the, they were not even recordings of crows. So a lot of really interesting things associated to that. But let's rescue what it is actually an accurate portrayal of crows. So in the movie, if you've seen it, maybe you've seen it, I don't know. But in the movie, the crows are always together. They're during the day and during the, the night or during the all times in the movie, they're always together. And that's actually, that is pretty important for the species. They're a social species. They're not necessarily social all along the day, but then they gather. If there's a predator, if there is something that calls their attention, they could be dispersed in a city, they could be dispersed in an area, but they have ways to communicate with each other. And that is actually, that's another thing that is portrayed in the movie, movie that they're kind of communi communicating, they're telling each other to go and chase someone else. But that's um, actually the communication. They pass information. Douglas, um, Dr. Douglas Walker 
at the university. He's been showing uh, in work in the hypothesis that this roosting um, center, that, that roost, roosting areas are centers of communication to exchange communication associated to habitat, maybe associated to um, food resources. So they are places where they can communicate. And also, obviously, it's at the end of the day that they go. So that social behavior, that possibility to be resting in one particular place, it's pretty accurate. The other part that are portrayed in the movie is that also the curiosity or the wanted to know, wanted to learn. That is something that it seems that is pretty obvious in many of the corvid species. They're very curious. They're evaluating the situation. They can recognize faces. So they can actually at certain times, if they have um, a negative interaction with a human, they're gonna remember. And part of the information that it was collected during the studies of Dr. Joe Marshloff and his students is that they remember faces. They can remember those faces and they can over pass among them than each other and also pass that knowledge over generations. The whatever they, they identified with a negative, the negative interaction with a human is passed to their kids. And that is fascinating. So somehow, based on, you know, probably observations of somebody who likes birds, they were able to uh, portray that in in the movie. Um, there was obviously very inaccurate portrayal of crows, this constant malicious bird attacks. Uh, birds could attack as a defense mechanism when let's say they're nesting and it happens if you are sometimes walking your dog in in along the, your neighborhood and during the nesting season and it probably at some point there was a negative interaction between a dog and a crow those crows are going to be very defensive to the dogs and if for whatever reason they identify you or a human that looks like you as a threat to them or to their babies. Maybe sometimes it could have been without thinking, they could attack, but not in a malicious attack. They're just gonna try to fly over you, maybe you know, hit with the legs and then fly away. Like the same way that they will do with an eagle if, it's, if they are afraid with them, but they will not attack to the point that, you know, they would kill people like in the movie. <laughs> also, the sounds obviously were not real. They were not real at all. The sounds that those birds do are just, they are fabricated with machines that at that time were the most modern things. And there is some other, obviously the crows are the main kind of a profile in the, in the movie, but there's also gulls that are in the movie. And also there's some swallows. And I don't know if you've seen the movie, there is some impossible behaviors that it will be happening for a bird with certain characteristics. So there are these little uh, swallows that at some point attacking this lady, but they have she's protected in the in the in the room, and these birds come and they actually with the beaks break a wooden door. This particular species, that kind of bird, will never they have no string on their bills to do that kind of thing. A woodpecker maybe, but you know, you will need to have hundreds of woodpeckers to go through a, through a door within minutes. So really fascinating. I mean, this is fascinating from the point of view of how humans we perceive and use information to get the attention on others. We like, we like gossip, we like things, we like, you know, some kind of a dark world. We like that as humans. So in our in our nature, that's attractive. Just for an anecdote, this is one of those the scenes in in the movie in which kids from a school are being chased and many of them attack. So actually, I was and this was this movie was filmed in California in Bodega Bay, and actually the how the the whatever was the school is standing there. So this is me running like kids in front of this. This is now a private property, so they're not necessarily very happy for you to go inside or anything on the gardens. But yes, they know that, you know, they have a little sign in there. So it's really kind of fun. And then 
this place has become, Bodega Bay has become really famous for that. There's cafes, there's a lot of paraphernalia being found, found in there. So really interesting that still, even that it's very, you know, more than 50 years old movie, it still is fascinating for so many people. Then we have another classic, 1940s, uh, Walt Disney's Dumbo. And in this movie, the, it has grow, actually brought a lot of um, a controversy in terms of your bringing a little bit of maybe um, some stereotypes for racism, like the crows in this movie are, I have like a, you know, Native American, a black, sorry, a black uh, African-American um, language and, and, you know, accents, which has not been um, necessarily been the best way to, to use it. That this was done in 1940s, not necessarily something that people were very aware and sensitive. That's something that it needs to get attention. Um, that is important to, you know, for cultural aspects, respect the identity of people. But at the same time, and that's some of the negative aspects, at the same time, some of the things related to the personality of uh, crows, or, or at least to the behaviors of mobbing, or, or you know, sometimes they just do a lot of like flying, mobbing others, and they can get a little bit of that maybe represented um, in in the movie. And there's a little part of the fantasy in which with a feather, they teach Dumble to fly. He was the center of a lot of jokes because of his large ears, but then they, he can use it as wings. So kind of bringing a little bit of that. There's a, oh, many other movies that have been much more recent. And when I talk about recent, I talk a little bit about the mid uh, 1900s to now, right? Um, the, in which there's always something associated to either death or associated to malignant character. So in this case, the course bride, there is a, a, a guy, a groom that is very shy and is practicing his vows. And then he didn't realize that a dead woman was listening in, in that cemetery where he was practicing. He was listening to that. And then she assumed that she was, he was reciting those vows to him. So anyway, at, the, at some point, crows appear in one of the, the scenes and you know some of those crows are representing this connection between the land of the dead and then the the world uh, the alive world so a little bit of connection um and and a little bit of magic behind that so this is actually kind of a cute movie um if you've seen brave brave um this very energetic and amazing girl who comes to conquest everything she's fearless um and there's a character in which there's a witch where the crow that it seems to be a family member to her so again this there is the constant fighting with the good person uh, character with the bad character the bad character the little dark sinister has a crow associated to them and harry potter there is a scene with Buckbeak executed. There's a lot of crows showing in that part and very, very sinister, um, you know, scene. But at the same time, it let, you know, ravens during in England and in um, in many of, if you have in England or you've seen pictures in many of the castles, ravens are actually portrayed in there. So there is also um possibility that you know there's some positive aspects to raven and there was a uh, possibility in one of the one of the um um students having to be a um a pet raven in the movie this uh this is very you know i talk about harry potter which is pretty well known series of books and movies um, at the same time, there's some of the other things that are not very well known. This is a really great documentary. If you have a chance to see, it's called Tokyo Waka. And this happens actually in Tokyo. And this is associated to the jungle crows that they live by the thousands in parks in Tokyo. Just like what we will see 
in Washington, like, you know, in Bothell or there's uh, some other um, um, roost, like in Portland, in Portland, Oregon, when you're in downtown near the river, there's also at the end of the day, thousands of crows coming near the river uh, in downtown. So very similar to what we see in our area. In Tokyo, in one of the plazas, there is, it's a roost for this jungle crows. And it makes a really interesting um, parallels of the of the lives of these crows and the situation happening in the city. And again, this is a documentary, it's not a movie, but they, they interview several people from homeless people, from vendors, from a Buddhist priest and just people that are in that, that they go to this park or they live in this park and the connections I have established with the crows in the city. So really interesting, interesting um, um, portrayed in something that normally people may not pay attention to make a documentary that it has become really well known now uh, but at the time, it was only known in Tokyo. But um, it has a lot of information about the life of crows in this city. Uh, again, this is a different species, but with very similar um, problems to challenges. A lot of the city officials don't know what to do with so many crows. The crows are nesting everywhere, kind of causing problems in some cases during the breeding season, attacking people, so people are afraid. So a lot of urban situations in this in the in the process. So anyway, a little bit about you know media in terms of movies, documentaries. Also, when we talk about literature, literature is something that has accompanied us. And I could talk includes in, in, especially you know since the past times I didn't include those. But if you have read anything that fables from Aesop, a lot of the stories. And a lot of the themes in those fables have ravens or crows. There's one that is one of my favorites that it has some, um, and, and I've seen the crows do that, which is fascinating. And that's what is more, even more fascinating because all these authors somehow have been observing these behaviors of crows and ravens and different species, and they have used them as inspirations for their stories. Um, so in this fable of Aesop, his um, crow is like adding, there's water that he cannot drink because it's in a vessel that is too long for this build to reach. And it start adding little rocks, pebbles until the volume raises. Because of the volume increase, the water raises and he can drink. So, and of course the fables have like their own morals and the story is really cool. So anyway, just kind of bringing still is past, but uh, Shakespeare, just one of the greatest um, authors in the history of humans, incorporates a lot of birds. Actually, not only ravens and crows, but a lot of a lot of birds. And in particular, Lady Macbeth, excuse me, and Hamlet, they are characters. And again, usually associated to something dark, a sense of premonition. There's tragedies in here, deaths that are going to happen and crows are involved in there. Uh, a famous poem. Again, one of those things that this fascination for animals that are highly, they're smart, they can learn, they can, uh, they yes, they can come to dead bodies for other reasons, not because they are attracted to that, they're not bringing dead, but it's still fascinating, even the most famous authors and bringing that sense of loss, the tragedy, the darkness. So no wonder why people always associate these birds with something bad. Um, or they could also be associated to something that, you know, either a little bit more uh, kind of a mischievous characters like the crows in, um, in Dumbo, but also there are some other little stories that probably you have read. Um, as in which there's characters that are going to be associated to to crows, the wonderful Wizard of Oz, there are crows with a scarecrow, with a um, the scarecrow that it was not able to scare any crows, and that's probably sad for them. And um, but at the same time, the crows, you know, the the crow, the an old crow, 
told them something about how important that to have a brain was. Um, to Kill a Mockingbird, the story of, uh, actually, this, sorry, this is about a bird, not about a crow. Um, a series of unfortunate events. There is, uh, there. if you read this book, it's the, st the story of two orphans that they have a malignant cousin. They did a book, and then also there was a movie done later, and I think it's Jim Carrey who's um, in there. So it's, uh, they have a cousin who's really mean, and, you know, traps them to do a lot of chores to these two orphans. And then they actually, this cousin, there's a series of books, but in the seventh book, it takes him, um, the, the, the story takes in a small place that is overrun with crows. And, uh, and in, the, in that uh, story, they also uh, talk about the Nevermore tree, which is associated to a roosting place of the crow. So again, bringing like the natural history into the stories. And just pretty much coming to a more recent, this is a very fascinating um, story in many ways because it's funny. And it takes place in Seattle where we have a strong connection with crows. We have crows every day, everywhere we see them. They actually have really interesting, you get to know them. And if you have somehow developed a little relationship with a crow, even if he doesn't live in your house, it's not a bed, but even if it's outside of your door and you see them that they know you, they learn a lot of things. So Hollow Kingdom, something you've been reading and probably you know way more than me and many more details. Uh, it's a really interesting story in which uh, Steve the crow has this really, you know, great role in the book. I mean, it's a mix of a funny book with, you know, some kind of a darkness associated to this zombie land apocalypse you know, deaths and walking zombies and all of that. Um, in the city, pretty much run by the pets, right? By animals. So really interesting how even that the author is anthropomorph anthropomorphizing, I can never say this word, anthropomorphizing personalities, right? Because it's an interpretation from the human perspective. But there are some really interesting aspects of the natural history and the accurate portrays of crows that they're able to learn. They're curious, they can recognize voice, uh, faces and voices and sounds and you know different species they can mimic sounds so they can you know many actually crows and ravens can even talk and repeat sounds especially ravens and they ask that is strong association with humans and not even other other species so it's real that that's what this is from a video in one of those pages of natural history like popular natural history of a crow and actually, this is a young bird interacting with a dog. It's it's a young bird that it was adopted for a family. So it, it, it has a lot of fantasy and a lot of things that are unreal. But at the same time, it brings a lot of really interesting, real stories that are incorporating into this fantasy. And what it got my attention is that at the pretty much you know, we think about this apocalypse as being like something caused by, you know, nature or something that is all supernatural, but actually pretty much the zombie condition is what because due to cell phones. And that's just wanna kind of pretty much close with that, the fact that um we are those of us who still are observing birds, observing wildlife in wherever we go and even in urban environments. And we don't let too much technology to interfere with that ability to discover the wonders of nature. We are very, very privileged because the majority of people are being, a tra are being trapped by cell phones. And that's as much as, you know, technology is good. We need it. It has helped a lot in so many ways. At the same time, it could be a big interference in between us and learning about the world around us and the fascinating life of birds and plants and 
many other organisms that are in front of us and share this planet with us. So I constantly tell my students, and in my classes, I tell them, use a cell phone, but also if you're gonna use your cell phone, sometimes look at nature, take pictures, make videos, use your observation skills, take, put the phone away for a moment and enjoy watching what an animal, what a bird, what a crow is doing. And just um, to tell you, we hope that the crows keep inspiring us. I've been so lucky that I can teach about them. I can do a lot of things associated with them. And they have inspired a little bit of my own art. So I do some pottery that I have been incorporated in some of my learning about crows. I have been able to incorporate that into uh, my own life, not only teaching, but also my own, you know, creativity. So doing some pottery inspired with this is inspiring one of the illustrations on the of the book and the company of crows and ravens by Mars Luf and illustrations of Tony Angel. So I did that. I use this graffito technique in one of those. And there's a crow here using a tool, which is another really cool thing. And this is inspired on the roosting arrival into into um uh, Bothell, and this is my piece of mating display. So with that, thank you very much to all of you for your attention. And I'm happy to take any picture, uh, any questions, also pictures every day. Thank you very much. We do, in fact, have questions. Excellent. Thank you. Yep, and I don't know ahead. if I should leave the, the screen. I will leave the screen with a picture instead of me. We I'm got ready for questions. Sure, we've got a couple um, that wanted to know. Um, uh, crows can recognize uh, can recognize us, but can they recognize our family members? Family members within them. That, that's the question. Or if they can recognize uh, human family members, in, yeah, they can recognize individual faces. They can recognize individual faces. So, and I, you know, that's one of the studies that John Marsluff did. And I don't know if I have a slide with that. Um, this is part of the, the, the study that they did. I have the mask people in here. So actually they did a study in campus with masks because um, when they were trapping crows and at the beginning they started trapping crows and they didn't have any mask. And then, they were, you know, the researchers will go into the university and they will be get, they will be mo be mobbed by crows. And they will say, wait, do they notice that I am one of the ones who are trapping them? And then they did a study in which they use different masks and this, this mask people were having different behaviors that were threatened to them and they could recognize specific face, faces. So it's not that they just recognize, oh, that's a human. No, they recognize specific features of the faces. They even, you know, put um, they put certain masks that they have certain connotations in the behavior towards them. And they also will switch the, the, the mask and put it upside down. The crows can actually turn upside down to recognize, I mean, the heads, they will turn their heads to recognize the features of that face. So that's from the point of the research, they identify specific faces. So they know which is more dangerous than another. And that's most likely based on the danger that they can have, right? How comfortable they are closer to a person or not. Anecdotically, I can tell you that the crows, for example, in my house, we have three, three crows that hang out around. They know me and they're very comfortable with me. I mean, I don't ever touch them or not. I don't. When I establish eye contact, they don't like that much. But they know my husband too, even that he doesn't feed him and he doesn't feed them and he doesn't um, interact much with them. I'm the one who's more like trying, you know, but they know if he is around that I possibly can be around. So then they're kind of waiting. When they see him, they also approach and see if maybe he will get, get food. But they can tell the difference between me and him for sure. So that's, and I can tell that based on this experiments that Marsluf and his students did. Yeah, that's pretty fascinating. Pretty fascinating. Yeah, on on the note of uh, 
crows remembering things. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned crows remember negative interactions. Do they yes. just as easily remember positive interactions? Exactly. Yeah. So they seem to be, I mean, that's what they feel comfortable near certain people, especially those that are being feeding them, right? If you see in the street, there is, I, I don't do just think case. I'm not that crazy lady that, that, well, I shouldn't say crazy. I don't, that, that dedicated crow lady that um goes, you know, there are several people, not only ladies, there are people who go to a place with a bag of peanuts and they just start walking and, and dropping peanuts. The crows know. And even if that person is not dropping peanuts, when they see it, they will just follow her, follow him, follow they, that person. And they will recognize as a positive and they get very close. I, they get very close to me when I'm gardening because they know that I'm going to be digging. And they're behind me. Sometimes my husband has taken pictures of me with a crow. I don't see them sometimes. And they're very close and they're just picking up things behind me. So they feel comfortable as long as they are not. And they 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 have to know that uh, situation. So in, it's the faces associated to a situation, positive or negative, and they can react differently in those situations okay changing gears here a little bit uh what's the typical size of a murder of crows in the wild versus in the seattle metro area yeah so in the in, well this is an interesting thing in agricultural lands it's much smaller so the crows are not in dense forests you're not going to find crows in this forest crows in in natural habitats let's say in wild, more wild habitats crows are less numerous and they could be, they use borders of forests. They're not going to be the forest interior. Crows, I'm sorry, uh, ravens use a little bit more of forest than crows. Crows use the, the borders of the forest, the intersection between forest and open land. They're much more in disturbed areas. And they have grown significantly in human environments. And this graph is exactly from what... Um, um, this was um, one of the students at John Marsluk, John Withy. He did. Uh, he looked at data of crows and humans. So the dark bars are crows, the light bars are humans. And the more the humans, the more the crows. The reason is that crows are opportunistic. And they are going to find more possibilities to get food near humans. So a standard Let's say a roost on a city, it could be, depend, depending on the size of the city, obviously, it could be anything from like what we have in Bothell at some point is being 14 to 16,000 birds. The roost in Portland, Oregon is about 10,000 to 12,000 birds. And in suburban um, land of areas where the density of, of humans are less, it can decrease significantly to maybe just a few hundreds or maybe, you know, kind of in the low thousands. If there's enough of opportunities for food resources and land for them to use. So it's a very significant difference between urban and suburban. And what is really even cool is that some of the studies of Mars look to see you see bands in these birds. They have put bands of metal and also colors so then you can actually tell who is who and they've been mapping them where they go. There has been and the increase of population of crows in um, Seattle air, metro area has increased exponentially and, and not necessarily because there's more nest on the urban areas, but the crows from the suburban areas are moving to the city. They they nest and they reproduce in the suburban areas, but then they move to the city. Well, the mortality in the city is a little bit higher, but anyway, it's uh, the cities are better for them. There's some species that they actually benefit by human density, and this is one of them. That is like such a fascinating. It's fascinating thing too. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um I have a kind of a bit of a long question. Do crows yeah. form murmurations? Uh if yes, how complex do these murmurations get um yeah. in terms of a form in the sky and yeah. uh how many crows are often in a murmuration? Yeah. 
I, to be honest, I don't know. Um, if you ask me, what do I, if I think that they will do murmurations, I don't think so in a way that, so usually we see murmurations in like a smaller birds in which their flight, if I mean all birds fly fast, right? But um, especially a smaller birds and depending on the shape of the bit of the wings, they can have faster speed when they're flying. And you see that in starlings, you see that in uh, a lot of smaller shorebirds that they do murmurations. Crows are much larger and their shape of the wings are not necessarily the most efficient for that kind of a super fast flight that it's very common in enumeration. And that's a strategy and an anti-predatory strategy, a strategy, right? That happens when there are predators around or it's like, it's the safety in the numbers. Crows are a little bit, and they're a little bit bigger and they're way more vocal, they're a little stronger. So the strategy of anti-predation is actually much more of confrontation and mobbing. So it's a different strategy that they use in an anti-predatory. They can do groups that they will tell the predator, here we are, we don't have one you here. And they can actually, you know, they can chase eagles. They, they, you've seen them, they chase predators. So there's two different strategies. They use more the, the one that is attacking the predator, making it visible and vocally and just being so annoying that the predator rather be gone. Not to say that, that eventually, of course, there's predators that will affect them, especially when they're in the nest. When they're older, it's harder for a, for a crow to be caught by a predator, not to seem possible. Some of the eagles in Bothell, they have learned to eat um, crows and they come to eat crows. Although my guess is that possibly it's a solitary crow, a little bit weaker crow, or maybe an older crow, because the um, they would be faster than an eagle. But anyway, yeah, that's a little bit longer answer, but um, I, I don't think it's being observed and they use different strategies. So my guess would be that maybe not. Um, I think we, we might have time for one or two more. Um, yeah. Is everything you said about crow similar for magpies, mating, food, et cetera? It's similar, but not necessarily exactly. So there is some groups of animals that they have certain behaviors that are common to the family, that are common to the type of birds, like magpies, jays, they all remember things, they remember faces. Actually, the studies of self-recognition have been done in magpies, in which magpies, they can, in a mirror, they can tell that they're not a different animal, that they're themselves, which is fascinating to other birds they don't necessarily recognize. They would be on a, on a on a mirror and they are attacking the mirror thinking there's a different individual. Magpies can recognize themselves. Um, but they also do, they do very similar. Um, they, they're they very smart. They learn very quick. They get associated uh, in, in the east part of the, of the state. We have more magpies and they are much more also city uh, birds in certain places. Um, they learn to recognize certain aspects of, you know, danger or so. There's not too many studies uh, in Washington, the way that there are some crows studies in the numbers, but several similarities, several similarities, yeah. Okay, and we'll do uh, one more, um, a, uh, a person named Sarah says, Ursula, my appreciation for crows stemmed from your ecology class. Since mm. then, my partner and I have been trying to make crows our friend by giving them unsalted peanuts. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> what else can we do to have a crow friend? Yay, that's great. That's great. I mean, and that's something, you know, it's so important that humans, we have really great connections with urban wildlife, respecting them and all. I, it's unavoidable, our human nature to, to I, sometimes I wish I could touch them, right? I wish that, but obviously I also, re, it's so great to have that relationship. Um, feeding them is fun, it's great to have a little friend, 
But at the same time, and this is just as a kind of a second note, um, excessive amount of food, and not only for crows, but for birds, is not necessarily good in general for, for animals because it could add, cause a lot of changes in their behaviors and in their connections with other species. But it's such, we're so privileged in, in Washington in particular, um, and you know, in urban areas where we live, that we have a great abundance of urban wildlife and having those connections, you know, providing habitat, providing safe spaces for birds, for crows, without exaggerating a little bit with the crows because they're an excessive population. Um, but then just making safe environments for them is really, really important and the appreciation. And thank you so much. If, if you know a little bit of what I contribute with this connection with our crows for you and your partner. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you took that class. All right, and with that, we are out of time. Ursula, thank you once Excellent. again thank for doing so this much. for us. Thank you for everyone being here. Uh, we will have another program with uh, Kaylee Swift. Uh, oh, yeah. I've put Excellent. the link to yes. it. Actually, this yes. is a picture. In here, yes. there is Kaylee. Oh, Kaylee, I just, this picture is of Kaylee, and she did a really cool study about that. Oh, that's awesome. Probably she's going to talk about um, the crow funerals, yeah. And, Wonderful. Yeah, and I'm happy, you know, I know there's many more uh, questions that I'm seeing it in here. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to answer that if you send me an email or something. So happy to share my email with people if they want to ask me um, a question. Or you can find me at the website of the University of Washington, Bothell. Happy to answer your questions. Perfect. And with much. that, uh, have a great rest of your night, everybody. Go, go. Mm-hmm. <laughs>